not sure where I where I really fit into the, su the sustainability argument, but um, I, I mean, we had a farm. I mean, my people moved into Worley Farm 150 years ago, and, and so I got a bit fed up with some milk in the cows and things. <laughs> so I invited a few people around, and uh, um, so uh, um, after 45, um, 42 years, the, those the, those few people turned into 200,000 people, and. Uh, so it's a great event, and I must simply enjoy what I'm doing. And and um, uh, um, we do we do produce two million pounds a year for various charities that we do, and we're quite involved with, with housing, with uh, with social housing. We did 22 in Pilsen, uh, and we did 100. Uh, um, uh, um, over, uh, um, uh, I said where the tsunamis were you know, in in Southeast Asia. Uh, 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 the houses in Southeast Asia were hundred pounds each, and so I don't know what happened to them since. Um, uh, so if anybody's going over there, can they check them out for me, please, uh, uh, and and see if they were useful. Um, but the the Pilton houses are, are the houses that, that we built from stone. That are for local people to rent, so that they will never ever be sold. Uh, so, so, so it always be housed in Pilton for for sort of working people to live in. Uh, I said a reasonable rent. Uh, um, but apart from that, the festival itself is a bit huge and a bit bit um, uh, um, um, so out of control. I would say. I mean, from a sustainability argument. We have to import a lot of stuff to keep that show on the road. Obviously, I mean, I mean, we use a million, we use a million gallons of water every day, uh, and so that has to come from from just the waterworks, and uh, which is not very sustainable in some people's eyes. But uh, 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 but there's plenty of water at Chew Valley Lakes, and so we just suck it out <coughs> through, through a great pipe about six inches. Uh, 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 um, six inches big, you know, uh, and uh, so we draw all that water out of the system, and it works very well. And whether whether that is fair to do or not, I'm not too sure. But the, the water people, but, but anyway, uh, uh, um, um, uh, uh, the farm itself. Our farm is. Uh, I've got 400 cows and 200 heifers that we, we farm out. The heifers go on other people's farms, but the people that have given up milking raise our heifers now. A lot of them do, and, uh, and so, so that we pay one pound twenty pence per heifer per day, so that that's their income, um, which is quite a good income actually. Uh, and um, that we produce eleven thousand litres of milk a day that goes into Robert Wiseman's um, 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 factory at Bridgewater. Uh, and, and we've got the highest yielding herd in Somerset, believe it or not, uh, from the National Milk Road Cross last week. So that's pretty good. Uh, I've got a very good chap and his wife. They got up half past three in the morning and milk the cows, so seven days a week, with, with the three Polish fellows. And um, so, so, so I've got a really efficient dairy farm. But, 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 but there again, it's not all that sustainable. We have to import a lot of stuff. Uh, and, uh, and we use apple pumice from the side of Hatchet Shepton and we used to, we used to buy maize from Wedmore and all that sort of thing. So it's not very um, so self-contained as such. Um, so we're a very high production farm and it is very efficient and we've got really good results and we've got a good pedigree herd of cows. Uh, so um, that my cow and his wife are very I should take the credit for that rather than me, although I do pay their wages. <laughs> uh, and um, so, so that's me really. But the festival itself, uh, um, look, of course, has sort of rather dominated the farm over the last 40 years. It's sort of been a very gradual process. Any questions out there? Will that come later? Does it? I reckon so, Mike. Uh, yeah? If you're done, that was lovely. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
hasten to, I did hasten to add at the start of it, Michael obviously is most well known for the, um, the, the pop festival that goes on there. But I did make the note it was the highest field in there, didn't I? <laughs> off, of, off of my local knowledge. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did. So it, 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 okay. the industry, it is recognised that it is a very, very productive for the case. <coughs> and we can come on to the solar installation and stuff like that later yeah. on as well, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, I've got much time, yeah. Right, John English, um, who wasn't sat at the table when I uh, welcomed the panel just now. I don't know anything about you, so you'll have to do introduce yourself. Okay, over um, to you for 10 minutes. Okay. Well, I'm actually due to give a talk this uh, on this afternoon's panel for the Resilient Farming Day. I'm representing a man named Luke Hazel, who may be known to some of you because he farms some suckler beef herd down the road in Compton Martin um, for the story group with his business partner, Jim Twine. Um, Luke, a very visionary entrepreneur, and one of his projects is something called the Community Farm, along with Phil Horton of the Better Food Company. Um, Luke would have loved to have been here today, unfortunately, he's at a family wedding. Um, I am one of the employees and apprentice grower at the farm, started as a volunteer. Um, community Farm has very much changed my life and my way of thinking, and actually find, found me and something else to do with head, heart and hands, just in terms of doing something. I, I found the farm through my local transition group, started as a volunteer, became an employee, and now very much with an interest in organic horticulture. Um, the farm is overlooking Chew Valley Lake, very close to here, um, converted to organic uh, two, three years ago, and was set up as a community supported agriculture project has been running on that basis for about six months now so still in our first full year as a CSA um, and we the farm through 400 pioneer investors raised 120,000 pounds in order to buy out the operational business which was uh, two three hundred veg boxes a week through the better food company a quite well established wholesale business and supply and fills two shops in Bristol as well um, and we've kind of hit the ground running with that and I guess why people are interested in us is through Phil and Luke's vision we've actually tried to develop a new model for how, lo how local food might work as a community owned not-for-profit business but as a serious enterprise as well that has a vision to expand that has professional employees who are paid as well, but at the same time trying to engage the community. CSAs start in different ways. Some start from a community who are interested in keeping a local farm or a project going. Some start from the other side of things, which is how we have, through a business who sees an opportunity to do something in a slightly different way. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that if you'd you'd like me to or, or, or take questions on it. I have a talk for this afternoon, I don't have my notes with me, and I wrote them quite late last night, I need to sit and have a coffee and read them again. Um, I'm, I, I apologise again that Luke's not here. What you'll get from me is very much a view from the ground, and somebody who's committed to making the enterprise work and <coughs> seen kind of all sides of it. I did help do some of the fundraising as well around Bristol and Bath last year that kind of got us to where we are. But it's not my enterprise, so I hope to be able to speak for it today. Okay, thank you very much, John. Okay, can you hear in the back? Yeah. Yeah? Right, we keep getting told to use the electronics. It's only because it's actually being filmed and recorded and it won't pick up properly unless we use the microphone. Right, yeah, I've been told. <laughs> there we are then. Well, there's one thing I've picked up straight away from what John's just said. Um, I've never come across it before, but I love the sound of it. Head, heart and hands. And it really means something, I think, when you're actually doing that. You're engaging the brain. Your heart's really in it. There's a passion for it. And you're using your hands to do something. So it strikes a chord straight away. Um, next, I'd like to hand over to Andy. Um, we've known each other, I think, pretty well ever since we were sort of that long, in one form or another. Um, we've both taken quite different paths in our careers, but at the end of the day, I think we've both got similar objectives of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so with no further ado, I'll hand over to Andy, who is also, for those of you who aren't aware, he's the host of um, this um, whole function as well. Thank you, Nick. Thank you to all the other panel members here. 
And to all you who've come along to the conference and come to Fernhill Farm, a big welcome and a big welcome to everybody outdoors. Hope you're all enjoying yourselves. Fernhill Farm, we're mostly about survival and about trying to do things that have the greatest kind of step on we can always get. But bearing in mind that you've got to cope with uh, the environment that's surrounding you. We took on Fernhill Farm 14 years ago. It was on the open market. Prior to that, we were um, contract shepherds, world keeping as many sheep as we could, as well as we could, to put that on the kind of commodity market. So all those who appreciate good quality lamb and mutton would be able to buy good quality lamb and mutton. Part of all that resolve and um, a little bit of working with the public is that I was very aware that a lot of people have been segregated, separated from how food is produced. We were doing lots of school visits. That was also linked in with Arbus Brothers, where Nick works. A little project called Farm Link. And you'd have school visits, and you could see children and teachers were actually scared to ask questions, to um, actually try and find out where food was produced. If it had polystyrene and cling film wrap, it was safe. If it had a label of a supermarket, it was safe food. Show them a potato covered in mud, and they're a little bit sceptical that you can actually consume something like that. <laughs> Even to the degree that a fortnight ago we had a different event here and we'd been picking peas in the garden. Pea comes in a pod, which to this person I was sat next to was a major surprise. <laughs> Opened a pod, offered them a pea, and they go, oh, haven't they got to be cooked? And you just think, well, where's that information been lost? Where have those people been separated and left out in the cold that they don't know how they're surviving? Um, a few years ago, I went down to Michael's little gathering, had a brilliant time down there. I was shearing sheep at Glastonbury, which again was a major learner. Um, by inviting people onto your farm, which we try and do at Fern Hill, through different times of the year, different groups, whether it be a school group, learning difficulties group, or linking in with someone like Dan Herring, a Sunrise Celebrations and having the off-grid event here, it's bringing people to the farm, it's bringing people and exposing them to a little bit of nature that hopefully isn't too crowded that they can't take it on board that they are in a natural environment. And there's um, different priorities we all have in life, but the fundamental ones, if you can have food, you can have shelter, you can express yourself in, a, in your natural ways, which is not unlike the way we try and keep our farm animals. There's a lot of standards which we abide by with keeping our farm animals, which if the government had to abide by those for looking after the humans within their uh, country, I'm, th I'm sure they're going to be failing. So what we've tried to do, big step on from last year, port -a -loose, things like that, nobody likes them, so we've gone on and plumbed in our own uh, toilet system. That all links back into the wetland system which we have on the farm. And that's how we try and look at problems, is that it's not a problem, it's an asset. The old, far, old saying is, there's money in muck. Well, we're trying to turn human waste, thank you to all our guests who <laughs> helped to maintain that cycle, through our wetland system, we're now producing clean water at one end, plus willow, plus we have a huge natural environment where um, lots of birds, lots of amphibians, lots of different wild insects live. And I'm still amazed every time I walk into it that it, it's a total change of environment. Hopefully you're going to have a little bit more, hear a little bit more about that from Jay. I see, I was born on a sheep farm, I love my shepherding profession, and at times, maybe tomorrow afternoon, or maybe later on today, I will just hop in my trap, or wander off with my dog and go out to the sheep and check them, because I gain what I think is a little bit of sanity by being surrounded by sheep rather than humans. But there isn't that much difference. You give them a chance to escape and they will escape. <laughs> but I think what we all need is, we definitely need a resilient agricultural system because every day we all need to eat some food. Vegan, meat eater, anywhere in between, you've got to have good, healthy food produced by hard-working farmer somewhere. Um, and what I'd say to everybody to remember is, if you've eaten today, thank a farmer. He's somewhere out there working. Thank you, Nate.
Uh, thank you, Andy, and I'm sure we all appreciate what you've put on up here, or what you and the team have put on up here, and hopefully we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll derive some more benefit in the next hour or two. Right, finally then, for his, um, the last 10 minutes presentation, yeah, no more. Um, Jay Abrams, um, we're looking at wet systems. Um, is that going? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, my name's Jay Abrahams. I run Biologic Design. Can anyone see that photo at all? Can everyone see yeah. it? That is a waste treatment system for 350 dairy herd. It's the final pod in a series of six, and there are fish in there. So that's what I do as my main business, is create constructed wetlands for water purification, wildlife habitat creation, and resource production. So they're not reed beds, they're constructed wetlands based on soil as a purification medium rather than gravel, so they've got a very low embedded energy. There's about 70 slides here, which I don't think I can do in 10 minutes, so I'll just talk. But I just wanted people to know that I'm doing a talk this afternoon, two o'clock in the off-grid college, where we'll be talking about wet systems, tree bogs, and low-tech anaerobic digestion. These are all what I term low entropy systems. And although I trained as a microbiologist, I now view myself, and I put on my census form this year, I'm a low entropy systems designer. A low entropy systems, is everyone familiar with what entropy is? Yeah. No. Okay, well entropy is the price you pay for transforming one form of energy into another. You always pay the price of entropy, which is energy that can no longer be used usefully. It's the first and the second law of thermodynamics. The first law is energy cannot be created or destroyed. There's a certain amount of energy in the universe and that's it. The second is uh, whenever you transform that energy, you lose some. So a classic example is the motor car. You have petrol into the engine. That petrol then gets burnt and produces noise, energy, heat, movement, uh, noxious gases. Most of those outputs can no longer be used usefully. So an, an, a heat engine, like a car engine, is probably the worst form of device. What I tend to do, oh, and most waste, and my thing is waste treatment, and most waste treatment systems use huge amounts of energy to purify that waste. So we're creating entropy all the time. And entropy is basically heat. And if you want to stop global warming, that's one way of doing it. Just one way. So being a microbiologist, I know that living entities, living organisms, microorganisms are very efficient at transforming energy, waste, matter, whatever you care to call it, from one form to another, from say noxious waste to pure water, is what I do as a living. And so working in the waste treatment, is conventional waste treatment industry for 10 years, designing what I now term totally unsustainable systems based on huge motors, aerators, mixers, steel tanks, concrete. I read Bill Mollison's book, uh, Permaculture Designer's Manual, and all of a sudden I realized I couldn't do that anymore. So I stepped back, set up biologic design with the express aim of using constructed wetlands to purify waste, not using any non-renewable energy. They're solar powered, they're gravity fed. I've done about 92 of them now over 20 years and about only half a dozen, including this one unfortunately, has a pumped feed and that's the energy input. The major embedded energy, if you're familiar with that term, is the diesel used by the machinery that creates the wet system to start with. After that, it's free. Um, if I just click forwards a bit, this is uh, the same pond on this dairy farm. That's what the field looked like before we did the wet system. Is that all right? Can you see that? Because it just saves me having to talk too much. So low entropy systems, they mimic living systems. They use the life force to create whatever you want. You make the system, you create the environment for the bugs, the microbes, and the plant interaction with those microbes, the root zone, to do what you want to do. And you use different plants for different wastes, say cider effluent, which you'll see a, a picture of Western cider, incredibly acidic. So you need to have acid tolerant sedges and, and willows. Uh, things like a dog kennels, huge ammonia content. I'm, I was told when I went to the Environment Agency to get planning, you couldn't have 
uh, kennels on a reed bed because the gravel system would not cope with it. So I said, well, it's not a gravel system, it's not a reed bed, it's a soil-based system. They had said you couldn't deal with more than 50 milligrams, of li uh, 50 milligrams per litre of ammonia. This kennel system is dealing with 930 milligrams per litre of ammonia. So we use no non-renewable energy to purify the waste. Uh, they've got a low embedded energy and it creates resources from what most people would view as a problem, a waste. We don't have the word waste, we have the potential resource. So since 93, when I set up Biologic Design, we've done 92 systems. We've just done the Herefordshire cattle market, the new market there. Um, unfortunately, I was bought in at the last minute and they had decided to go for a chemical dosing system. That would have cost them £100,000 more than the wet system cost them, plus £40,000 a year running costs. So not only are wet systems ecologically sound, but they make good economic sense. And put those two together, I believe you've got a winner. Um, let's just crack on a bit, get some pictures. Uh, biologic design is a carbon negative business because we plant up to 60,000 trees per year. The business is run from our off-grid cottage. We have no main services at all. We have a few solar panels, a small wind turbine, and our well. So I've lived off-grid myself for 28 years. Um, so there you go, sewage. Applications, sewage from one person to so far 400 people, although I've just done a design for 1,000 people for a, uh, a boarding school in Shropshire. A countryside visitor centre, which was designed for 250,000 people a year, now has 500,000 people a year. Off-grid dwellings, small holdings, barn conversions, any farm diversifications. Uh, industrial applications, if you like, cider, brewery effluent, dairy parlour, cheese, ice cream manufacturing. Any biodegradable waste can be handled by the bugs in a wet system. So there we go, Western Cider Mills, a few photographs, an aerial one to start with. It's an eight acre system. It was initially designed as a total absorption system, had no outfall, therefore no consent to discharge, therefore no on costs. It was gravity fed. We planted 50,000 trees on the site, about 70, 17,000 water plants. Um, they've increased their output of cider now, because everyone keeps drinking the stuff, from 17,500 cubic metres of waste a year to 120,000 cubic metres of waste a year. Looking at it fairly conservatively, the wet system has saved them approximately a million pounds a year in costs of having to upgrade a mechanical plant and run it. That's what it looks like from uh, the air. It's a series of swales and earthen banks and ponds. And the bottom ponds now feed 180 acres of orchard with purified water, which increases the yield of apples by about 1.5 tonnes per acre per year, which makes more cider, which makes more waste, and round it goes. So that's what the site looks like on the ground now. Can people see that up there? Am I in the way? Um, so the trees which we planted as finger-like sticks are now big trees. So the thing with a wet system, because the trees grow, because they get bigger, because the evapotranspiration rate gets more and more effective, because the root systems get bigger, the wet system gets more efficient as time goes by, rather than with conventional systems, which mechanical systems, as we know, always break down at some point, wearing out blowing fuses. That is a swale. In the foreground is the swale ditch full of reeds. In the background is the, the bank which has loads of willow on it, which can be coppiced to produce the resource for basket work, uh, hurdle making. It can be used for biomass fuel or living willow structures, garden furniture. This is a very acid tolerant species. It's also really good it's hemp agrimony, very good for bank stabilising. This is a great uh, willow herb, again acid tolerant. It forms a nice reed raft over the surface of the input inlet pond to stop any smells. That's just a, it's, um, a water figwort and that's a good nectar source for insects. 
And these are my, what I call my willing workers. These are the, the fruiting bodies of the fungi that are present in the root zone that do the job. And there's all different sorts of them. And they're all there working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing a job for me. So that's a wet system for sewage for up to 1,500 people on a campsite, a scouts campsite in Herefordshire. And here we have Sheppey's Cider Farm, which was started August 20th, 2009. It's right by the A38. I'm just going to whiz through that to show the transformation. I hope that's all right. Just catch that. That's my blank canvas. That's the formation of the swale. This is a swale being created on contour, ditch and bank. And the nice thing about following the contours of the land is once you've done it, the system looks like it's been there forever. It looks really natural. So here we go, oh, before I go on to that, that's the, uh, that's the earthworks compacted and then the topsoil put back on. As I said earlier, the wet system relies on topsoil as a purification medium, not gravel. So the topsoil is on site already. You don't have to import thousands of tons of gravel. So we'll crack on a bit now. And then we'll, this is the bottom pond being topsoiled. Here's the waste coming in from the existing lagoon, which was now defunct. They didn't uh, have capacity. Off it goes. Unplanted, it still works because remember it's the bacteria and the fungi in the soil that's doing the job not the plants. The plants are actually in a, an active symbiosis with the bugs and take oxygen down to them so they enhance the process but the job will be done purely with the soil to start with. So there you go, that's the stuff coming in, lovely. And uh, that's the crew, that's what did the job, three weeks, job done. Then we power harrowed it, seeded it with a wet meadow mix and then four months later we get that. Bit of a transformation. We plant the wetland plants along the edges, plant the willow. There's the willow coming up above the grass. That's the final pond in the first year. There's the water plants in the first year. Things getting established. That's a year later now, in the summer. You can see the margins are now fully established. The ducks are moved in water weeds, reeds, rushes, sedges, willows. So two years later, that's the input, that's what we're using. That's the first swale, second swale. Well, that's still the first swale, that's the second swale. Other end of the second swale. And as you come down the system, you can see the, the quality of the water improving. That's number three. Number four, and then we'll come on to the bottom one in a minute. There you go, that's the penultimate one. You can see the quality of water, although it's not totally crystal clear, it's like any other farm pond. And that's the bottom pond. That's what we aim for, is bathing quality water. There's a little autumn shot, swans are moved in. We've got lots of pussy willow, which is great for the bees. In fact, there are bees on this side. That's the quality in the bottom pond. Crystal clear. Ducks love it. Bees love it. So that's another yield from a wet system is honey. Honey from waste, lovely. And uh, that's the bottom ponds. Three years on. Look like they've always been there. And I always say there's uh, no moving parts in a wet system. Wind in the Willows, we call this one. This was an unlined system. I know, can I have another two minutes, three minutes, just to whiz through it? Okay. Uh, Sustainability Centre, Centre of Permaculture, Information Sharing. Um, they had an existing sewage treatment works which was defunct. It was actually leaking sewage directly into a protected aquifer. Has been, or had been, for the last ten years. Uh, they wanted me to do a wet system there, so we, we approached them. It had to be lined because it's on a chalk, very porous chalk um, substrate. So this is what we had. We had uh, the whole site is basically woodland, overstood um, 
uh, conifer plantation. In terms of ecological value, virtually zero, very dark, not much value in the timber. So what we did is we use particular organic carbon or wood chip to mulch our systems because it adds to the efficacy of the system. So all of the wood on site was chipped and stacked and then we started doing the earthworks. I think you can see that yellow line there, that's the line of the swale and it's my job to make sure the levels on site are just right and the swales follow the contours and the diggers dig away. We lined it with a geosynthetic clay liner to prevent any <coughs> a egress of wastewater into the aquifer. And then the soil goes back on top. Remember, the soil is the purification medium, not just a planting medium, it's what does the purification. So there you go, that's the first swale. This is the second swale. There's the wood chip going on in the planting areas. There's the willow going in. That's the willow establishing, growing. Between start and finish of these slides is four months. Just bear that in mind. That's the inlet. That's the biggest borage plant I've ever seen. <laughs> it's a metre across, <laughs> buzzing with bees. So that's what we do. We do constructed wetlands, we do composting toilets called tree bogs, and we do low-tech anaerobic digestion, all of which I think can be of interest to farming community. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Jay. Um, I'm sure you'll agree, just by these four pre short presentations, you can see that there's quite divergent businesses that these people are actually running. But I guess just by those few um, short introductions to their business, you can see that they've all got a common interest in what they're actually doing. Everybody, all, each of them wants to be sustainable in, the, in their business, whether that's uh, reducing the impact on the environment or making enough money to be able to keep on going next year, as in Andy has so modestly says he's aiming for survival all the time. Um, but for those businesses, you can see that they're all trying to do a similar thing, albeit in different ways. What we're trying to address this morning, and hopefully what we'll address, um, as we said at the start of it, is talking about energy use on a farm and how you can reduce the, um, the bought-in energy in effect, so the off-grid um, type systems. Waste, what we're doing with waste to minimise the impact. Um, and that might come, I might play a part in that once the questions start going about what comes from dairy farms and um, associated activities. And then the education in tourism, and that's, that can be addressed in different ways. Um, and then again, the whole generic thing about the um, natural resources. So on that basis, I would like to open it up to the floor, um, invite Michael to come back and sit down and see you can be bombarded with questions as well, if you would, thank you. Um, and take the first one. Anybody like to start proceedings? I was just going to say, um, if, if we pass, I'll pass the microphone around okay. to the person doing the question. Chap at the back then. Start running. Please, thank you. Go on, I'll stand at the end of the Thanks. Uh, just out of, before you ask the question, just out of interest, um, just to get, gauge what the audience is about, is there any sort of small holders or people that are producing stuff in the back garden type operation? Hands up, anybody who's doing that? To be got that. Anybody off grid? Yeah, that's encouraging. Anybody with aspirations to go off grid? Even better, look at that. Right then, panel, that's the sort of people you're dealing with. First question at the back, please. If you could just introduce yourself in your interest, that would be great. Thank you. Nick Rosen from offgrid.com. I just wanted to ask Michael Evis, having heard the, the other speakers, um, would you now be likely to be more likely to investigate the possibility of using radically different methods at Glastonbury, for example, wetlands, um, as a way of dealing with waste? Um. I went to Sheffield to, to look at the wetland thing, and uh, 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 as far as I could see, I was losing so much land that I'd lose half the uh, of, of Worthy Farm, you know, the main arena, so there'd be no place for people to go and watch the bands and things. Uh, um, I mean, that was my sort of take on it. Just ask. I've already done but the I'm sure you do a hell of a good job. I'm not criticising you, but I'm not prepared to give up. So, um, 20 acres in the middle of the site. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and, and, uh, I mean, um, 
So we do have a read bed of our own, actually, that is, is a, a homemade version. Really, we should have consulted with, what's your name? Jay. Jay, we should have consulted with him, really, because we would have, we'd have done a much better job. <laughs> anyway, it does kind of work, but can we have a look at it for us, will you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so I would like to improve it, actually, I have to say, but um, I'm not prepared to go over 20 or 30 acres in the middle of where they farm, because obviously the site would be gone. Does that answer your question? Oh, thank you very much. Right, thank you. Next question. Please. Anybody who wants to ask a question, just so we don't have a sort of a, a hiatus each time, if you just sort of catch my attention, just I'll make sure that the microphone's passed to you while the, ask, the previous question is being answered. Right? Uh, Jay, Jay, we can all imagine what comes out of cows, but what comes out of a uh, cider works, um, do you have to design things in a different way for each kind of uh, product you're treating? Yeah, each, each wet system is site specific. As we're using soil, um, the soil on each site can range from nothing to you know, 18 inches of fantastic meadowland or orchard, so orchard soils. Um, also, the underlying substrate is it's varies. So, if it's sand or if it's porous, then the system needs to be lined. If it's heavy clay and can be compacted with, say, a sheep's foot roller, then we don't need a liner. That affects the cost. What affects the design is the diurnal variation, the monthly variation, the yearly inputs. So you've got to design it so that you maintain what's called a plug flow uh, kinetic regime within the wet system. And that is the most efficient way biochemically of treating any chemical, any waste. Um, so yeah, each one is site specific depending on the soil, the subsoil, the space available, how deep one can go to get the retention time to enable the stuff to stay in long enough to be treated. So yeah, it is. Um, each one is a one-off, really. Right. Thank you. Question for the microphone distributor to start yeah. off with. Yeah, another question for Jay. Um, I was just wondering, uh, is it possible to propagate um, algae from the effluent of, uh, say, a dairy farm or from a festival site in order to grow? So I've been, I've, I've been looking at a spirulina, and spirulina algae is actually a superfood and you can produce oil from it and I was just wondering whether that's something that could be incorporated into a wet system. Yes it is. Yeah, It's just another type of biological reaction that you put in the regime that you've got. Uh, the main thing that prevents that is A, it's not been done and people are very wary of being the first and second it, it needs um, specific tanks uh, which adds to cost. Sure. But Again, you know, if energy continues to go up in price, then all of a sudden things that were uneconomic before have become economic. It's AD, for example, anaerobic digestion, is something that you know, brought me into the waste treatment industry to start with. And um, 30 years ago, AD was not economic. And now it is, because oil has gone from $5 a barrel to $80 a barrel. Because, yeah, from what I understand, you can actually generate diesel from it. Yeah. Dan, I like your question and your thinking there because I think next year we could have a little restaurant at the bottom of the wet system. <laughs> Quicker turnover of product, more willow growth as well, perhaps. Right, thank you. Question there, and we're back to you, made in the middle now. Hi, this is for Jay. Um, you mentioned that when they, um, as the trees get larger, they become more efficient. When they become fully mature, do you need to replant? No. Um, you can either manage it as a coppice wood, wet coppice wood, and, and take the yield off, or leave them like at Westerns now, because the input's gone up so much, we don't coppice it. We let them go to full size. Uh, at some point, they might start shading themselves out, so we cut them down and they will be firewood, or wood chip, which we then add back to the wet system. But they become... Uh do they lose their no, not at all. They get better as they get older, really. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then when, you know, willows are fairly short-lived trees, but I suppose even the shortest of willows is going to be 40 or 50 years. So we haven't got to that point because the oldest system, wet system, is now 20 years old. But, you know, when we get there, we'll, we'll sort it. We don't have problems. We just have challenges. Right. Thank you very much. 
in the middle? Higher. I guess it depends on you know, the size of the place, but approximately how much land cost and how much financial cost are we talking for tree bogs? Are we talking to tree bogs? Again? Yeah. Okay, well, tree bogs are a composting toilet system. Um, they have been made at the Big Green Gathering at uh, Lower Pertwood Farm for 35 pounds of scrap timber and volunteer labour and six inch nails. They've been made out of oak, cleft oak and sweet chestnut to a fantastic degree of complexity and luxury. So really it depends on what your budget is and you know, if you want to do it with pallets or cleft oak. But they can be, you know, if you do, if you want a, um, a pucker double tree bog made of sweet chestnut oak, uh, you're looking at about two thousand pounds, two and a half thousand pounds. But if you want to make it yourself, you're looking at whatever your time and energy is, and what materials you've got, and anything in between. And how much land space would it? For a tree bog. Yeah, a tree bog is not a wet system, you know that, don't you? Yeah, it's yeah too okay. Different, so it, well, yeah. a tree bog, I mean, obviously, I'm quite large, so I like a lot of space. Um, so, whatever's comfortable, really. How about for a wet system? What what kind of financial for land, sewage land? Yeah. Um, well, I I always say to people, look, give me ten square meters per person, which is approximately the size of a parking space. One can do it as the size gets big, as the population gets big, you can do it to five square meters per person. But I like creating wetlands and therefore if I'm creating a wetland I like to create them as large as is possible because then you get the ecological value, you get the resource production value and obviously you've got a huge resilience within that system to take shock loadings. I mean, Andy's system for the everyday uh, inputs is massive but because it was designed for the 20,000 people who were going to be here at the Big Green Gathering who unfortunately never arrived it's, it's huge, so whatever Andy throws at it should be fine forever, really. I mean, you're talking a wet system being in place for centuries because there's nothing to wear out. Right, thank you very much. It's a good answer. Now, one thing I would say, whatever standard of um, tree bog you put in, just take the splinters out if you're using re <laughs> reused wood, I think. Next question, please. Hi, I was, I was reading recently about the potential tax changes to agricultural diesel that's going through... Commons at the moment, or Lords, I'm not sure where, or EU. Um, and I'm wondering, how do you think that's going to affect the, the resilience of your businesses? And um, what are you planning to do if it comes about? That's a real good question, I think. And um, maybe Michael, you'd like to start off. Yeah, We've got, you know, red diesel. They're looking at, you're looking at taking the, um, you know, the, the tax advantage away from farmers yeah. and. Um, put in order to normal, try and make make farmers more uh, carbon efficient, I think. I, I believe so. Is it only if you go on the road, isn't it? If you stay on the farm, I think you're okay. Uh, but uh, tractors on the roads, uh, they, uh, um, they're going to be stopped from using red diesel, which is kind of fair to do, isn't it? Okay. Or not? My understanding of this was that the, the tax of, uh, was going to be added on to all red diesel, for, regardless of whether you're falling with it. Yeah. Which it would be fair to use because, in effect, tr um, tractors are a cheaper option in lorries for local haulage. And my understanding was that the tax was going to be added to red diesel if used in the field. Um, that'd be tough, wouldn't it, like for farmers? Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you can't avoid using red diesel on a farm, can you? Can you, actually? Are you the way? You're the master of all this, aren't you? <laughs> it's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> we do use a lot of it, that's all I can say, and it will cost us a fortune. Go on, you've got some. So it will be bad news. I think what all farms are trying to do at all times is study your input costs. Um, there's a lot of keen economists in the farming industry itself. We do an audit every year on what our actual inputs are, whether it be electric, water, wherever your utility bill is, and I take red diesel as one of those. And it's reviewing what you're doing, making whatever job you're doing is extremely efficient as far as you can. Um, we run minimum amount of equipment on this farm because I believe for 11 months, three weeks, it'll probably be parked up doing very little. Um, there are a tremendous amount of farms that you'll see with half a dozen tractors parked up there. So they've got a huge embedded cost in what they're actually what they're doing. If we need a job done, I go to a local contractor who I would deem to be highly efficient in what they do. There's some power and resource you've got to use, whether it be 
a big 100 power, 200 horsepower tractor coming in doing the job, or whether you actually think, right, we're going to take, take this and look at it another way. Do we actually need to harvest that? Do we like hay making, like silage making like for us? Or is it better that we actually don't do that ourselves? We buy that product in. Someone else has used the fuel, but they've cut, say, 100 bells an acre rather than 50 bells an acre on our farm and you maximise your returns wherever you can, but that needs a greater integrated system throughout the farming community, which is happening. People are communicating, people are comparing and contrasting. Um, but we're all, we all need to learn a great deal about not being wasteful. Um, if the cost is coming on to red diesel, it's gonna come back to the consumer. If it's gonna come back to the consumer, they've gotta find that middleman to make sure they're not just exploiting everybody and rising their returns themselves, but I think we've all got to be more resourceful and actually not waste what is produced at the end of the day. I think it's about 25% minimum of food that's produced is actually chucked away. And that could be the core of this argument or discussion that actually be a little bit more savvy about what is produced there in the first place. But yeah, diesel's going to go out, it's all going to go out. We've got to look at other methods, minimum tillage, uh, a lot of farmers practicing that. There's a lot of ways you can reduce your fuel costs. Right, thank you, Andy. And a, the, a point that's just been brought up from the floor, actually, is what you can't reduce the amount of tractor work you can do um, when it comes to arable farming, or but then, so in fact, that is. Um, and I'd just like to open it up. I could, you, we can be provocative if we want to. What does everybody think about GM type technology? Because that's one way that potentially farmers could reduce their use of red diesel. Uh, the thing about GM is it depends who controls it. Okay. Um, I'm not convinced that the technology itself is bad. I do, but I do think it's immature. Yeah. I think it's controlled by, by big corporations for the wrong reasons. Absolutely. So what are you suggesting that if it's proven to be uh, effective, responsible use, if, it's, if the science is proven, not necessarily by those that are developing it, is it a good thing? I think it's probably inevitable. Right, okay. And what does other people think about that? Take generations to prove it. Sorry? It will take generations to prove it. However, right. they don't accept the five-year studies. No, no. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's right. Me again. I was just going to say that actually, um, since the, the birth of the supermarket, we've all now, um, communities are dispersed, we're all moving around a lot more and driving to try and, you know, driving 10 miles down the road to buy a carrot. Um, but I think the whole the, the purpose of like, this debate as well is to, to see whether or not there's an option for actually being more resilient more locally. And um, certainly I'm finding I, I, drive, I drive a horrible transit, I'm afraid. <laughs> But um, over the last five years, the, the cost of me going down the road to the supermarket has doubled, at least. And um, actually being able to source food locally um, would, would reduce the need for so much diesel at the same time. It's the same as the energy debate. Um, we're being asked to turn our kettles off or only fill them up this much, but we've got whole football stadiums that are being lit overnight. Um, and that's, that's pushing a pressure to build more nuclear reactors, for example. But actually, if everybody was more conservative with their energy use, would they need to build those advanced technologies? And are we, are we talking about um, increasing industry, or are we talking about trying to meet solutions for yeah. everyday life? It's a really good point. And I think I would just like to hand over to John to make a comment about the local production and stuff in a minute. In the meantime, we've got one question. Gentleman with a blue on on. Then I think we're going back into this direction and then back into there. So you're lined up ready for that. Yeah. John, have you got a comment to say about the local uh, local provisions? Yeah, I mean, local provision is is something that <coughs> was one of the core reasons that, that, that Phil and Luke set this up, is to try and provide as much as we can locally sourced fresh veg, and in Luke's case, meat as well, around, around Bristol. I don't know if you've read the... Um, people are from this area. I've read the Who Feeds Bristol um, um, study that Joy Carey put out earlier this year that was uh, instrumental in the first food policy council in the UK being set up, is that because of the, uh, the pattern of farming around here, um, 
fruit and veg particularly in terms of local supply to Bristol is actually quite in, in short supply. I can't remember the numbers, but it's like something only like 15, 20% of our current needs is capable of being produced locally. Now that demands a number of different solutions. You have to start looking, for example, you know, at, at, at scale of farms, at city farming, um, and if there are very large fuel inputs involved in actually getting the produce over to here, then how can we, what sort of models do we need to become more efficient at that? Um, just in terms of local supply and the point earlier about driving to the supermarket, I saw um, things in the news quite recently that the number of journeys that people are making are going down, um, that they're tending to buy less fruit more. Um, and we're trying to get people interested in, for example, in buying groups, in local hubs where we supply whole van loads of veg boxes in one go rather than us having to go out on a delivery run. Um, these are quite slow to take off, quite hard for us to organise. Um, but we, I mean, we, we have an aim to try and set up 10 local, local delivery hubs this year, which will at the same time try and encourage people more, for example, to try a veg box from us um, or from one of our competitors. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, if anybody's interested in that, is there a website they can look on or anything like that? Yeah, we're, we're at um, www.thecommunityfarm.co.uk. So, yeah, there's your adver advertisement for this morning, advertisement for this morning, please. Uh, hi. One of the aspects of resilience that you need to consider as well as the average age of a farmer. Um, apparently it's over 60 or something now, um, nationally, and for the few that are left, they're having to work even harder. Um, how can we sort of address the issue of getting more and more young people into farming, um, either just as a, 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 you know, wants to come and visit and maybe stimulate something, or is education um, authorities trying to work with that aspect of trying to get more people employed in, in, in farming. Okay, thank you. That's a very good question. I, would, Michael, would you like to address that one to start off with? Okay, there are quite a few students actually coming out of colleges these days. Uh, uh, um, well, we've got three at the moment, uh, um, uh, and they're quite cheap, I have to say. Uh, uh, and and um, yeah, we just hope that they're going to be useful at the end of the day. Um, I'd say two out of three are, are, are going to be quite handy for us. So there is a movement now because with high unemployment <coughs> and the students can't get into college or anything. So the farms are quite a good option actually. Uh, and we need lots of labour at Worthy Farm. We've got all these cattle and all these people and everything. And um, so now I've got three poles, which I would prefer, really prefer English labs really. Um, nothing wrong with the poles, they're fantastic, they go up in the morning and stuff. So they'll look it up on time. They're never late for work. You know, they don't take days off sick or anything. Uh, uh, they are very good. But um, uh, uh, but to be a bit of a patron myself, I try and buy bridge stuff whenever I can. And 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 um, um, so uh, so I would prefer to use English chaps if they were around. Uh, but the students are coming on now quite well. So things are improving at the moment. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Yeah, a very uh, key subject to my own heart, really, is uh, through the Shepherd Inn, I've met a lot of people and worked with them that have got into the sheep industry. They've come from the middle of town, they've come from villages, no connection with agriculture, have worked on sheep farms, gone shearing, and now running their own places. So there is plenty of, there are opportunities for young people to get into agriculture, but the farming community possibly haven't sold themselves well enough over the last 20 years. It's something that uh, we're looking to put right. There are the introduction of schemes which are linked in now, um, uh, pressure being put on the, the government to uh, kind of allow the introduction of um, apprenticeship style schemes where there is actually a, a payment to the farmer, which may seem wrong. Why should a farmer get paid for training somebody? But why not? It's a very skilled subject of actually learning how to manage sheep how to maintain a tractor, how to be involved with the industry. Everybody needs training. Um, I was very fortunate, I was brought up on a farm. You learn every day how to do things, how to do them right, how, to, how not to do them wrong, because it costs more time, costs more money. We've had a lot of interest with school visits, with uh, colleges coming to the farm, and there are lots of young people out there desperate to get involved with food production and management. High cost to get involved, but they are out there. We've, I would say over the last five years since we've opened up the farm more to people, 
there are a lot of um, foreigners in this country. Don't take that the wrong way, please don't. They come to our farm and a lot of their ancestors come one, two generations back were farmers. They were moved into towns through not their own reasons, young Somalis, young people from Palestine. We've met them here and they just want to get involved with farming. They've, their ancestors were growing, their ancestors were keeping stock, they want to do the same. And 20, 30 years time you're going to see a change in the British agriculture. These people will come into money through their own trade. There are, there's a young Indian fellow out here about a month, six weeks ago. He's set up his own business, he's going to go and buy a farm. And he's 18, 19, I would say by the time he's 25, he will somehow have earned the money to buy a farm. There are a lot of keen youngsters out there, I don't think we're in a problem. Um, there is opportunities and there's lots of landowners that are more than willing or more than happy if somebody approached them and say that I've got this burning ambition to be a producer and I would hasten to that well, you could say farmer then this is my idea you know there's there's lots and lots of landowners that would set aside a few acres just to let them have the chance and it's got to be commercial because at the end of the day you're doing it it's not just for uh, you know some wild idea about it it needs to be productive enough and pr pr profitable enough that those people can make a living on it. But there are people available. If people got that inkling to get off, off, off their backsides, you know, if you look at some of the youth of today, haven't done ourselves a particularly good service in the last couple of weeks, there's lots, lots more that are good and want to get something out of it. Sorry? Yeah, I have. That's really segregated minorities. Well, that's, that, it, you know, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, yeah, that's but that's the sort of people that get on the television, not somebody like a friend of mine who's now 40-something, who bought a, or had a landlord, let him have an acre to grow strawberries on as a college, a college project, who now has land that he rents, he doesn't own very much, in Herefordshire, Scotland, Hungary, South America and Spain. He got off his backside and did There's lots more people like that than the ones that we've seen on the television recently. And that's the ones we need to concentrate on. Sorry, moving on. Go on. Um, just another issue that I'm aware of is I think that one of the things that's possibly putting young people off getting involved in farming is it's a pay and housing issue. I mean, people are probably quite happy to work on low pay, but access to cheap rural housing is what we're aware of, is putting a lot of people who might otherwise stay and work on a farm like ours and sends them into Bristol for jobs there or to live there. Um, our horticultural advisor, Ben Raskin, from the Soil Association, runs their apprenticeship scheme. There's a tremendously high dropout rate from younger people as a result of this. The older ones, who are a little bit better rooted, um, you know, uh, um, and probably have better access, well, maybe a bit more capital and better access to housing, tend to stay the course a bit longer.